Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Secret to Thriving at Work, A Positive Psychology Approach. My name is Jeff Murphy, and I'm an Associate Director in the BU Alumni Relations Office, as well as a proud alumnus of the BU Questrom School of Business. Today's webinar is sponsored by the BU Alumni Association and is offered to our 312,000 alumni around the globe. Throughout your career, the BU Alumni Association is committed to helping you define and achieve your professional goals. <clears throat> We aim to do this by providing alumni with access to a series of valuable online tools and social media communities. It's important that we get your opinion on how we're doing, so we very much look forward to receiving your feedback via a survey that will be emailed to all of you later today. I know that we have alumni joining us from the UK, Athens, Taipei, Cody, Wyoming, Miami Beach, Florida, Frankfurt, Kentucky, Freeport, Maine, and as always, dozens of Massachusetts alumni from towns like Andover, New Bedford, Leverett, Kingston, Melrose, Maynard, and more. For each and every one of you out there, please know that we really do value your opinion on this and every program that we offer. Before I introduce today's speaker, some brief housekeeping notes. As you know by now, this webinar is being hosted on the Adobe Connect online meeting platform. If you have any experience any trouble with the audio or visual portions of today's presentation, I'll ask that you please contact Adobe Connect at 1-800-422-3623. Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be made available for on-demand viewing on the BU Alumni Association website found at www.bu.edu slash alumni. Our speaker today is very eager to answer any questions you may have, and you're welcome to submit them throughout the presentation using the Q&A chat box you should see at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many questions as we can during today's webinar. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day. Uh, presenting from our uh, campus here on the Charles River is two-time BU alumna Sharon O'Connor. Sharon is a management consultant, development psych developmental psychologist, and co-founder of DKS Consulting Group. She has spent her career helping organizations and individuals achieve goals and reach their potential. Early in her consulting career, Sharon specialized in facilitating large-scale organizational change and diversity training for Fortune 500 companies, government agencies, and startups. Sharon's expertise in promoting diversity was highlighted in the public television program, Managing Diversity in the Workplace. During the past five years, her consulting focus has been executive develop development and career coaching. Her coaching model empowers managers to strengthen their capacity for leadership, deepen their understanding of organizational dynamics and transform goals into success. Sharon received her master's in social psychology and her doctorate in organizational development, both from Boston University. She's certified through the NTL Institute for Applied Behavioral Science in organizational developmental, uh, excuse me, development consulting, is a professional member of the OD network, as well as a member of the Institute of Noetic Science. Sharon, thank you again for being with us today and the time that you've already spent putting this presentation together. I'm going to go ahead and get your slide deck up and running, and uh, then the floor will be all yours. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff, for that nice introduction. Okay, everyone. Um, today, we're going to talk about the secret to thriving at work, a positive psychology approach. And I am here to tell you that you have the power to create your own happiness at work. And we know from research that people who are happier are more creative, more productive, and successful. So whether you don't like your job, hate your boss, think you're underpaid or undervalued, I'm going to share with you strategies from positive psychology that will help you be happier at work no matter what your circumstance. Hi, I'm Sharon O'Connor, a BU alum, and 13 years ago, I founded DKS Consulting Group, a career executive coaching and business consulting firm with my two fabulous partners, Dale Sokoloff, who's a clinical psychologist, and Karen Hoffman, an attorney who keeps us all out of trouble. And actually, Karen is here with me today. And we help people who are looking to be happier at work. Many of our clients come to us looking to change jobs because they're really unhappy with their current work life. And quite a few do change jobs and they're happier. But over the years, we have found that a lot of our clients ended up staying in their current jobs and they were able to become happier after we helped them make some simple changes. And here is something interesting. Some of the changes they made were how they do their work and some of the changes were shifts in how they think about the work they are doing. 
So today, I'm going to share with you strategies and stories of simple changes grounded in the science of positive psychology that it can help you feel happier at work too. And in fact, in a few minutes, I'm also going to share with you a couple of simple exercises so you can start being happier at work right now. So Jeff, if we could, could we take a look at the poll and um, see uh, what is, get a sense of what folks think is making them unhappy at work. All right, so I'd love for you to take a minute right now and fill out the poll so we can get a sense of what is making you feel most unhappy at work. And I'm going to read to you the questions. Um, work isn't challenging, I'm bored. Okay, the second one is work is too challenging, I'm stressed out. The third one is my salary's too low, I'm worth more. The fourth is lack of advancement, there's nowhere to grow or I've been passed over. The fifth is unsupportive boss, I'm unappreciated and disrespected. The sixth one is hours are ridiculous, I have no life. And the very last one is all of the above. <laughs> we thought we'd add what that one in there too. So if you could just take a moment and um, fill out that so we can get a sense of what you think is making you unhappy at work. Sharon, are you able to see those results as they're coming in? Yes, I see the results as they're coming in. And it's, um, I see that uh, the most, um, the one that is most, important to folks, or the one that folks are clicking on the most, is unsupportive boss, I'm un unappreciated and disrespected. And that is something that is very, very common. We see that with many, many clients of ours. And then the next one um, that folks are clicking on is the lack of advancement. There's nowhere to grow, or I've been passed over. That too is one of the um, common complaints that we get. So these are common things that we deal with when folks come to us. So I'm not surprised. But I want to share with you that no matter what the source of your unhappiness, we have strategies that can help you feel happier. OK. Can we set aside that for a moment? OK. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks so much for the poll. So let me talk about what we're going to cover today. And how we frame it is it what matters most. First, we're going to help you understand why happiness is essential for success at work. And then we're going to tell you the secret for creating the mindset shift necessary for achieving happiness. And third, we're going to share strategies that happy people practice to be more productive and fulfilled. And my hope for this talk is that you will learn how positively shifting your mindset can help you see possibility where you didn't see it before. So I'm going to start with a story and tell you a little story about myself. When I was small, I wanted to fly. Not in an airplane or even in a balloon, but under the power of my own wings. Peter Pan was big back then, and I really felt like this was possible. I thought, how cool would that be to hang out with the birds? I remember jumping from the couch onto a pile of pillows and pestering my mother to watch and see if maybe I was flying just a little bit. I taped feathers to my arms and I flapped all around the house and I jumped from porch railings and I even built a pretty decent set of wings out of old tent poles, garbage bags and twine, then spraining my ankle from jumping off the roof. My dad had had enough at this point and he said to me, okay, enough with the flying. I bet birds look at you and think they wish they could run and climb like Sharon. You have two good legs and two good arms and a good brain. Use what you have. Maybe it was the threat of being grounded if I pulled any more flying stunts, or maybe it was just a little bit of old-fashioned inspiration. But when he said, use what you have, something in my mind shifted. I climbed up the biggest pine tree in our backyard 
with a hammer, nails, and a few old boards, and I built a tree stand 40 feet off the ground. And on windy days, when the tree swayed, I was flying. Positive psychology is about focusing on what is possible, what makes us feel fulfilled and happier. And in our work life, it's about recognizing and using our best skills and strengths to create a job that is more satisfying. It's about using what we have rather than trying to be who or what we aren't. And when we work with clients, we help them access the power of who they truly are and use what we call their true self in their work life. Because when you do this, when you align your true self with your work, then you'll feel happier. So let me tell you another story. And this is how this happened for one of our clients. Jack felt like he'd tapped out of everything interesting in his consulting job and was stuck. After about 10 years at the same firm, he felt like he wasn't growing and he believed there was no room for growth. It was the same old, same old stuff. He didn't feel challenged and he felt like he wasn't making an impact and he no longer felt appreciated. And guess what? This mindset came with him to work. He lacked enthusiasm for his projects, he didn't speak up as much in meetings, and he kept to himself more than he ever had. He came to us because he wanted to find a new job. Our approach was to work on helping him figure out exactly what would make him happy. And it was out of that that his mindset began to shift. Positive psychology is the science of looking at people's strengths and focusing on what they can do. We don't look at all the negatives, all the things that are wrong, because that's how we stay stuck. Instead, we focus on possibility, because that's how we move forward. Is positive psychology the same as positive thinking? People sometimes confuse these two ideas, and I think and think positive psychology means being happy all the time, no matter what, or pretending things are great when they aren't. That is Pollyanna, and that is not positive psychology. Positive psychology helps you become more optimistic through strategies that shift your mindset. It's actually founded on the belief that people want to lead meaningful and fulfilling lives. And as you Penn psychologist and founder of Positive Psychology, Marty Seligman likes to say, it's about cultivating what's best in us and enhancing our experiences of love, work, and play. So when we talk about happiness, we're talking about real satisfaction and real fulfillment. And there are other benefits to being happy at work. Numerous studies have shown that when we are happier at work, we make more accurate and careful decisions. We negotiate better. We are so much more creative. We also use more of our brain, so we're better at problem solving. And we are more resilient in the face of adversity. So, how do you make that happen? Let me tell you where we begin. We begin by uncovering the skills, the strengths, and the experiences and the values that we love the most. We don't focus so much on the job, but we focus on who we are and what we enjoy doing. So let's get back to Jack. Jack felt completely stuck in his current position, and his mindset was that there was nowhere to grow. So not surprisingly, with this negative mindset, Jack remained stuck. So we helped him think about what he was really good at and also what he cared the most about. We helped him identify the skills he enjoyed using and the strengths that made him come alive and those experiences in his life that meant the most to him. And most importantly to Jack, the values he cares deeply about. 
For example, Jack is a networker extraordinaire. He loved to interact with new people and he's an amazingly creative problem solver and he also cared deeply about the environment. He wanted to have an impact. So we looked at those skills, strengths, and values and worked together to craft a vision of an ideal job situation for Jack where he knew he would thrive. And as we move through this process, a light bulb seemed to go off. Jack realized that the job he imagined existed right at the company where he was. He opened to a possibility that he hadn't seen before. And he became energized and started to engage with the people who were doing the work he was interested in. Jack reached out to them and offered ways he could be helpful and soon new opportunities began to open up right in his own company. Currently, Jack is thriving in the same company, but he is working with a totally different group and he's getting to interact with new people and solving problems that he truly cares about. And so Jack is a great example of how focusing on your strengths and thinking about the way to use those strengths in the job you're in can change everything about your day-to-day -day happiness at work. So, you might be thinking, this is just too hard, and my situation is just too different. How could this possibly apply to me? But here's some interesting research. Strengths researcher Michelle McQuaid created this very simple strengths-based exercise called a Strengths Challenge. And she asked people to pick one strength that they really wanted to use more of in their work. And then, for one week, carve out 11 minutes in their day to use that strength in some way, no matter how small. And then, finish by giving themselves a little reward. For example, Michelle decided to spend 11 minutes a day on developing her creativity. And as soon as she turned on her computer each morning, she read one completely new idea in a book or a journal, and then she gave herself a little reward, which was a cup of coffee. And she did this for seven days. It was that simple. More than 5,000 people in 65 countries took this strengths challenge too, and this is what we found. After just one week, Nearly half the participants felt they discovered new opportunities at work. That's one week, only 11 minutes a day. They also felt more engaged in their day-to-day -day life. Imagine what could happen if you carved out a small amount of time to use one of your strengths each day for two weeks. You can try this on your own. So. The next question then is, how do you know what you like to do? What skills and strengths do you want to use in your job? Well, this is how we help our clients and it's really low tech. This exercise helps us tease out what are you good at versus what do you like to do? And these are two different questions. We're looking to uncover what you enjoy using the most. We all have a lot of skills that we're good at, but they don't necessarily make us happy. I am great at sweeping out the garage or emptying the dishwasher, but these things do not do it for me. Here's a very simple exercise that we do with all our clients. We tell them to get a piece of paper and make three columns. And at the top, put the words skills, strengths, and experiences. And then we have them spend five minutes doing a brain dump, filling out the list. Skills are things we practice over time, like writing, painting, organizing people, PowerPoint. You can read the rest of them that we listed there. Strengths are things that we're born with and that come naturally to us. 
like being detail-oriented or funny or diplomatic. And experiences are just things that give us joy, paid or unpaid, work or non-work. They're things like running the Boston Marathon or chairing the fun, uh, fundraiser. So after you've done this brain dump, we take your list to an empowering partner or two. These are folks who cheer you on or help you problem solve. And then ask that empowering partner to add to your list. And when you're done, go back and circle the three things in each category that you love the most. These are the skills and strengths that are part of your true self, and they will form the basis of a vision of what you want to do at work. This is really the first step in thinking about your work in a completely new way. And let me share with you a story about one of our clients who did a great job using this exercise to rediscover her strengths, and it opened up her mind to new possibilities about using those strengths in the job she currently has. Susan is a partner in a big New York City law firm and she came to us saying she didn't want to be a lawyer anymore and that maybe she wanted to open up a bakery or a yoga studio. So one of the things we did with her when we started working with her was this skills, strengths, and experiences exercise that I just shared with you. And we asked her some questions, and you can ask yourself these questions too. When you look back over the course of your entire life, not just your paid work life, what experiences did you enjoy the most? And what skills and strengths were you using? Think about that for a moment. What types of activities were you doing when you feel in the flow? Or we sometimes like, like to say, what are you doing when you feel like time stands still? These kinds of questions remind us of situations where we genuinely thrive. And they open the door to possibilities for creating that again, whether it be in a new situation or our current work life. So Susan remembered that she loved public speaking and teaching. When she was in law school, she taught an undergraduate course in criminal justice and she loved it. It tied into her value of helping people, which is why she went to law school in the first place. Her current job didn't require any public speaking and she was primarily drafting contracts. But she realized that those opportunities did exist for partners in her firm. She just needed to seek them out. This was a completely new turning point for her. Not only did she seek out this opportunity at work, she also ended up speaking at this huge national conference that was so well received her work began to evolve. She went from being isolated, primarily drafting contracts in this very niche area, to collaborating on new projects with new partners she enjoyed more and she continued to present and speak. Susan's work became so much more meaningful and satisfying to her that by the end of our time working with her, she no longer considered opening up a bakery. So after you have a better idea of the skills, strengths, and experiences that make you happy, or we like to say, make you come alive, then the next step is to create a vision of an ideal job where you are using those skills and strengths on a regular basis. So why is creating vision so important? It's because a vision does two things. It helps open our minds to new possibilities and gives us a direction to move towards. And a vision also acts like a magnet 
pulling us forward towards our goal. We like to put it this way. We move towards what we think about. Let me say that again because this is really important. We move towards what we think about. So if, in fact, if you remember nothing else from this webinar, remember this. We move towards what we think about. Without boring you too much with details about how the brain works, cognitive scientists have demonstrated that the thoughts we hold in our head guide our perception of reality and then our actions. And the more we practice those ideas, the more influential they are. One important part of creating a vision and developing the ideas that are going to be helpful to you is to make sure that those ideas are framed in the positive. If you focus on what you don't want, that's what your brain ends up scanning for and finding. If you focus on what you do want, then your mind works to help you see those possibilities. We all have a tendency to focus on the negative, but it does keep us stuck. So, for example, if you say to yourself, I don't want to feel overlooked and unappreciated at work anymore, your brain is going to scan for and continue to find situations where you end up overlooked and unappreciated. And you may even withdraw from opportunities where you might be more visible. So instead, flip this around and say to yourself, I'm looking for opportunities where my good work is valued and I'm given opportunities to advance. Then your brain begins to scan for those opportunities where you can demonstrate that you have a lot to offer. So the thoughts you hold in your head influence what you see and what you do. So also, it's really important that this vision be as positive, specific, exciting, and focused as possible. And let me tell you more specifically how this works in a story that maybe you can relate to. Not long ago, I was in the market for a new car. Our minivan was on its last legs, and since my triplets, yes, you heard that right, I have triplets, they were going off to college, I did not need another minivan. However, I had no idea what I wanted. All I knew was that I did not want another slow, oversized mother car that fit all the kids, their friends, and their hockey equipment. I was pretty good at identifying all the things I did not want, which I knew wasn't going to help me, but I was just stuck on what I did want. And my partners, Dale and Karen, thought this was really funny because we work every day helping folks figure out what they want, yet here I was stuck figuring out what I wanted myself. So Karen asked me some questions. She said, if you could have any color car, what color would it be? Immediately, I said, red, of course. And then she asked, OK, how big is it? How many people does it hold? I said, that's a little tricky. I really don't want anyone in my car but me and maybe my husband. But I would like to cart my stuff around. So then she said, how are you using the car? Are you running errands? What are you doing? I said, oh, that is so easy. I see myself driving on the beach in Martha's Vineyard, listening to James Taylor with beach chairs and a cooler in the back. She continued asking me questions like this until I had a eureka moment I knew, and I knew exactly what car I've always wanted. There it is. My car actually doesn't look like that right now because it has dents in it. But <laughs> that's the car. Um, I wanted a four-door Jeep Wrangler with a removable top and great speakers for music. 
and I wanted to be able to take it on the beach. And once I knew what I wanted, I started seeing these cars everywhere. I saw them in the parking lot at the grocery store. I saw them as I was driving on the highway. And then, most importantly, I saw them in the Sunday paper under the auto ads. With a clear vision, my mind was able to see possibilities. We move toward what we think about. So whether you're looking for a new car or new challenges at work, more money, or a job where you can use more of the skills that you love. Crafting a clear, positive, specific, exciting, focused vision is just another positive psychology strategy that can help you move forward towards your goal. So, I want to leave you with this idea. You really do have the power to create your own happiness at work. By shifting your mindset, by shifting what you think about, you can begin to see possibilities that will help you to become happier at work. So now I believe we're going to open it up to questions, Jeff. And I'd love to hear some of your questions. Absolutely. Thank you, Sharon. That was fantastic. Uh, and I want to remind folks that they can go ahead and, and type in their questions for Sharon and Karen uh, using the Q&A chat box at the bottom of the screen. We have one that has come in from David. David is wondering if you can okay. elaborate a little bit more on, you know, for those clients that you have that have that struggle to articulate what their skills are. What, can you provide some tips about maybe some exercises or something that somebody could do in order to help better define their skills? Well, actually, the reason why we do that exercise, the skills, strengths, and experience exercise, and we put a five-minute limit on it, is because folks have a tendency to um, uh, think really hard and overthink this exercise. So what we do is that we, we know that this is a really hard thing. Some folks come into our office, and they just freeze up when they think about what skills you know that they have so we put a five minute limit on it and while they are writing down the skills that they have we are also writing down the skills that they have with them on separate sheets of paper and then we combine our list and if you're really stuck on identifying your skills a fabulous thing to do is to go to someone who really knows you well and ask them to do that ask them to contribute to this um, to this list and we tell people to try and pick folks who know you from over the course of your life not just your work life but a childhood friend it can be someone that you can just email and they will remind you of things that are um, that you're good at because sometimes we get stuck on this um, yeah basic things like computer skills uh, the other thing let me share with you how we differentiate um, skills strengths and experiences and the only reason we categorize these is that we're just trying to help you get them out of your brain we actually don't care which category you you put them in um, we're just looking for a process to help you get it out of your brain skills are things that you've practiced over time and the example that I used to like to use with clients is things like juggling. You're not born knowing how to juggle. You have to learn how to juggle and practice it over time. So things like that are skills. Strengths are things that you feel like you're born with, and other people would describe them as you were born. You were born make cracking jokes coming out of the womb. You were born creative, or you were born just being really, really organized. There are some people, not me, some people who are born organized. Um, so those kinds of things. Um, other strengths are things like being empathetic or compassionate, athletic. Um, some people are born with beautiful leadership skills. So these kinds of things, I, I don't know if that was helpful, um, but those are kind of the exercises that we do with people. It's really hard. So, you know, sitting with a professional to help them tease out what those skills are um, might be helpful. 
Mm. Well, I realized, you know, as I was reading David's question, that it's probably a topic we could do a whole other webinar on about, you know, how to really mm -hmm. identify your strengths and, and skills and things like that. Um, Je uh, Annette has asked a question that you just okay. touched on a little bit in your answer, but um, maybe we can focus on this uh, for just a minute. But Annette is wondering how you can positively influence those around you to help you achieve your goals. Okay. Well, that's that's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, we have this belief that we start from the inside and work out. Okay. So first, in terms of positively influencing others, we be believe that you need to be extremely clear yourself on what it is that you want. And then from that clarity, other people can then... Um, respond to that clarity. If you're unclear about what it is that you need, you're unclear that what it is that you want, you're unclear that what it is that can make you feel um, appreciated and successful, then it's very hard for people to respond to that. So the first part of the question, or the first th part of the answer, is to focus on all the ways that you can get very clear on what it is that you need and want. And then you can Able, you're better able to articulate from other people to other people what it is that you need. We um, we do a lot of executive coaching with folks on this particular question, um, helping them articulate exactly what it is that they need, and then helping them with the strategies for building relationships. And when you build relationships, when you're better able to build relationships, you're better able to um, influence people to. Um, help you get what you need. But the first step is really you getting clear. And I think that's what I like about that is that it puts the power in you and that you're not assuming that um, the power is outside of you. You actually take control. You control yourself. You get very clear on what you need so that you are in a place of power and in a place of um, able to negotiate for what you want and what you need. I don't know, is that helpful? Great. No, absolutely. Uh, and I know it's tough to, to answer these questions without seeing the faces of folks that are, are hearing your answers, but I, I think you're doing a great job, Sharon. And um, we've got some great questions that are, are coming, so we're just going to keep going okay. with that, if that's okay with you. Um, sure. Lori um, is looking more at the big picture and, and asks an interesting question. Uh, in your work with clients, what are the greatest difficulties that your clients face in implementing some of the practices, and, and how do you resolve that with, uh, with the work that you do? Um, it depends. We have such a variety of um, different obstacles that people face. I think one of the um, one of the major obstacles that people face is, uh, as I mentioned before, um, relationship building with people who have different personalities or difficult personalities. Um, I think that's a that's quite a challenge. Is how do you build a relationship? How do you build a relationship with someone who may not share your values or maybe a, an incredibly difficult personality, but you need to have a relationship with that person because they're a powerful person in the organization? So I would say um, that's probably one of the most difficult obstacles that people face is learning the strategies for building relationships with folks who are difficult. Um, and they can even be with peers, they can be with more senior folks, um, but that I'd say that's the major obstacle. How do you do that? Um, and there's all kinds of ways to do that, but um, you know, we begin the same way. We begin by looking at what skills and strengths you have and using those to build those relationships. Not by being anyone else who you aren't, but actually the opposite of that by embracing more of who you are and using those skills to build relationships. So for each person it's really different but we start at, with looking at who you are and what you're good at and what your strengths are and using those strengths to move forward. Karen has a interesting question and, and she also wants to point out that uh, she saw today in, in the Boston Globe there was an, a nice article about meaningfulness. Oh, uh, I love that. She was recently promoted to be a manager. Congratulations, Karen. But her question is, you know, she's been trying to come up with ways to help her team, uh, the staff that report to her, find their bliss at work. Um, and so, Sharon, her question for you is, do you have any suggestions for how she could facilitate 
a group activity with the people who report to her to, to sort of um, capture some of the things that you're talking about today? How could she sort of do that with her team? Any tips oh, on that? Definitely call us. We're coming right out. <laughs> <laughs> Finding your bliss. That's Joseph Campbell. I love that she used. Um, I love that she used that phrase to help them find their bliss. Um, well, you know, we didn't really get to touch on this in our in in the webinar, but we do a lot of work with clients on their values, and I think that um, when you can align your team's values with the values of the organization then that's that's when bliss happens and and there's processes and strategies and ways to do that um, so I think that uh, starting with helping people understand their personal values what's really important to them and then pulling together a thread amongst everyone you know being able to look at where we come together where we share common ground and then using that to advance the mission of the organization that's gold you got it right there people will come to work you don't even have to pay them <laughs> they'll, they'll come to work with bells on yeah we we work with teams to do that but I'm so glad you're doing that with your team yay you great Sharon, we had talked before we got started um, and identified a couple questions that you thought that you might get, and, and we got both of them. And so Jennifer is asking, well, first she says, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, but Jennifer wants to know, how do you deal with a boss who has a rude and offensive demeanor and somebody who puts you down? Oh, that's, it is so, so difficult. So first you start with, um, <laughs> start validating that, this is this is difficult Jennifer I mean it really really is to have a boss that puts you down it is not easy um, and I think you know there's a couple of things it depends on how you know the degree to which that they're putting you down if this gets to the point where it is abusive then we do recommend that clients leave I mean we don't want clients staying in situations that are truly abusive but if the boss is just unskillful and and doesn't know how to manage people and you know they think that the best way to manage people is by pointing out all the ways in which they're terrible um, that's just lack of skill and lack of ability to manage and so you know there's uh, others in the organization that could be skillful so when people have terrible bosses we tell them to look beyond their bosses for mentoring um, look beyond your boss for support look for others in the organization who are skillful at what they do and get your needs met by looking beyond just your boss so everyone knows that they need to manage their boss you need to manage their boss and create good boundaries around um, people who are you know not treating you well but don't expect that your boss is going to provide all all of the all the support you need I we would strongly recommend to look at the others in the organization who could be supportive and could provide mentoring for you and in the end Jennifer you can only control yourself <laughs> you can't control your boss so you can control your responses to your boss and you know our feeling is that um, they're not in a lot of ways unless they get a lot of heavy-duty training they're not going to change so in order to become empowered and in to feel powerful yourself you need to find ways to use your skills and strengths and experiences that make you come alive whether your boss is supportive or not um, your boss is just one a powerful individual in the organization but just one individual and we have worked with um, clients whose bosses have been absolutely horrible but they were able to get support and coaching and um, you know mentoring in the organization by identifying other other folks who um, could provide that to them so that's what we that's what we would recommend and then Christina has asked the other question that you had correctly anticipated that you might get. How do you create advancement or find advancement opportunities? Christina is happy in her job, um, but sees that there's no room for her to advance regardless of the fact that she's pretty content. So how do you handle that situation? Oh, Christina, I love that question. I love that question. That's really um, a matter of actually problem solving. 
That's a problem solving question. Um, sometimes, and as I mentioned in my talk, that um, when we're focused on all the ways in which I can't possibly find advancement, um, then that's what your brain scans for and you'll just continue to see a, a lack of advancement. I think what is important here and what is useful to you so that you can find advancement is to really take a clear look at what skills when you're using them gives you joy. What are those strengths that you have that really make you come alive? And then look for ways to use them in the organization. You need to take initiative and really move beyond your current um, defined job situation and just look for ways in the organization to use the skills that make you happy. And then what we have seen is this causes a ripple effect. Other people notice because when you're happy, when you're using the skills that you love to use, people are more successful. It just follows. And then with that success, other people and other parts of the organization notice and then that's where opportunities for ad advancement open up where they haven't been before. Openings come up when you're using your skills in a new way, when you're doing something different. When, Say one of your skills um, is you're particularly great at organizing events but that's not part of your job. If you organized an event that is, say, a, a community service event for your organization or a community engagement event. You were part of that. You were helpful to that. You're now getting exposed to other people in the organization that are outside your um, circle of responsibility. Other people begin to notice. And your job may evolve and grow. So we've seen this happen again and again and again. When people use their best skills, that they love using, that they would use um, whether they were paid or not because it just makes them feel so good to use them, people thrive. And then based on using those skills, if you can come up with a vision of an ideal job situation, not that that is going to be your next move for your job, but at least it gives you a direction to point your compass towards. It helps you to open up possibilities as well. So those two things, um, I'm hope, hoping that that was um, helpful to you, hoping that answer was helpful to you. Great. We have a couple more questions, okay. uh, Sharon, if you could, we'll keep, keep going. Sure. Happy awesome. to. Great. Uh, so Anthony's wondering, you know, you just, in one of your last answers, talked a little bit about finding a mentor. You know, if you've got that mm -hmm. situation where you've got a, a less than desirable boss, maybe finding somebody else uh, in the company that that can help. Um, and I realize that, again, this could be an entirely an, a different webinar topic that we cover, but do you have any suggestions for how uh, a young professional can identify and connect with a mentor uh, in the absence of any kind of formal mentoring program at their company or their organization? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that um, we tell, particularly the young professionals, is to look for ways that you can be useful to them first. Okay, so if you find someone that you admire within the organization, we don't recommend you going to them and setting up a meeting and say, you know, I, I could use some mentoring. I, I think that, that these kinds of people in the organization are very busy. Um, what would be more beneficial and the way that's actually going to land you a mentor is for you to find people within the organization that you admire and you look for ways to be helpful to them. You look for ways that you can um, help make their job easier and then they are naturally going to want to pull you in and mentor you because you're being helpful to them. You're making their life easier. Um, and th that is one fabulous way to build relationships in an organization with the leadership that may be extremely busy. I, I know we work with a lot of folks in very senior positions and when younger um, younger people in their organization look for ways to make the leadership's job easier, believe me, they will, they will reach out and look to, they understand reciprocity. Leadership understands the uh, 
reciprocity. That's how they got to where they are. So if you're patient and you can build the relationship over time with the leadership, they are naturally going to want to pull you in. That's the best way to um, really form a strong men mentoring relationship. And then you can, you can talk about formalizing it. Um, but I bet the folks you admire are folks who are really good at relationship building themselves, and they're going to understand. If you're giving them value, they're going to want to give value back. So that, that's our number one strategy for um, building a mentoring relationship. Sharon, are there before any... we last question from Kevin, okay. uh, we did have a couple folks who typed in uh, with questions about the process of working with you as a coach. Um, so could we put up that uh, slide with all of your contact sure. information? And then yep. um, if people do want to follow up with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Okay, so the best way to follow up is to email me at Sharon at DKSConsultingGroup.com. That is the best way. And we can um, work with you in person. We work with Skype. We have clients all over, actually all over the world. And we um, do Skype. We do FaceTime. We do all kinds of stuff. And, you know, the I guess if you want to see more, you should go to our website. Check out our website, www.dksconsultinggroup.com, and it talks about the different ways that we, in which we can work with you. Great. I mentioned and, our last question. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, one other thing I'd like to say is that we do offer a free 30-minute consult. To, and anyone on this webinar who wants to give a call and get a 30-minute consult would be happy to talk with you just to make sure that um, we, can, uh, we can meet your needs and we can serve you best. Oh, that's very generous of you. Thank you, Sharon. Last question is from Kevin. Um, he's just wondering if you have any books that you would recommend for people who are interested in reading more about the subject or, or maybe you're working on a book right now. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I was working on a book right now. But there's, I'm going to send you to a couple of uh, websites that I think you'll like. Because positive psychology is really, um, I call it an emerging um, psychological science. But it's been around for a little over 10 years. And it's out of UPenn. So if you go to um, the positive psychology, I think it's dot com or org website, there's all kinds of resources there. There's tests you can take. There is, um, you know, blogs and articles you can learn about the UPenn's uh, master's program in positive psychology. There's also some fabulous TED Talks. If you just put in Google, you can um, put positive psychology in Google and you could see some really, really fabulous TED Talks. Um, we've written quite a bit um, on, on this and you can go to our blog and see, you know, what we have to say. But I think there's some amazing resources out there. There isn't really one book that I would say that really is the, um, the best book. But the Authentic Happiness website and the Positive Psychology website, those are two different websites out of UPenn, are really the best resources for learning more about positive psychology. That's where I'd send you first. Awesome. Well, Sharon, thank you so much for your presentation today. I think it's really fascinating knowing the number of challenges that you know people reported uh, running into during our poll question that you know for people who are feeling like maybe they don't or don't want to change their actual job that they can you know using some of these principles that you've outlined sort of change the way they feel about it or the way they perceive it and I think that's really powerful. So um, on behalf of the BU Alumni Association, I just wanted to thank you so much for your time today. Oh, well, I'm glad it was helpful. I hope people liked it. Thanks. I also want to thank all of our guests for participating today. I also specifically want to thank the people who've donated to BU in the last couple of years. You know, the truth is we wouldn't be able to put on programs like this without you. So thank you for your support of the university. Uh, we've got a great webinar coming up next month. It's called The Art and Science of Empathy in the Healthcare Environment. It's going to be on July 19th. And you can view the schedule of all of our upcoming webinars, uh, view our library of, of a previously recorded webinars, uh, and register for all kinds of alumni events now on our website again at bu.edu slash alumni. And as always, if you or any BU alum you know would be interested in presenting a professional development or industry insiders webinar just like the one that we uh, had today, feel free to contact me at the alumni relations office or by email at jtmurphy at bu.edu. Thank you everybody for your time. Have a great day or a great evening wherever you might be.